Did you have any idea what you were starting that afternoon? You said you were too tired to move to another seat on the bus. Not that day, of course. You've got to have a lot of emotions. I don't know if they are anger, bitterness. Well, uh, there were certainly moments when I was in prison. I would like you to meet a gentleman by the name of Kevin, who suffers from the disease of AIDS. And some days, if, it, if I have a very good day, I can make it from my bed to the bathroom door. I will continue to speak out on that. Understanding that history, does that make you more comfortable in being Oprah Winfrey? Well, hello and welcome to the final edition of the Lynn Hayes Freeland Show. We have spent many a Sunday together and in the next hour, we're going to reflect, we're gonna laugh, we're gonna share, we're gonna talk about my haircuts, my hair colors, but probably most importantly, I'm going to share with you some of the highlights of my 40 plus years here at KDKA and hosting this show. Now, if you're a longtime viewer, you know we started as Vibrations and ultimately became the Lynn Hayes Freeland Show. But over the course of that time, not much changed. We interviewed celebrities, we interviewed local folks, and we interviewed history makers. And certainly for me, one of the highlights was the day I got an opportunity to sit down and talk to Rosa Parks. I am Rosa Parks, here from Detroit, Michigan. Did you have any idea what you were starting that afternoon? You said you were too tired to move to another seat on the bus. Not that day, of course. Uh, I was on the concern with getting home to take care of what I had to do and get back to my work and then have the meeting with the young people and try to keep the uh, senior branch uh, records and so on and get memberships for that. And I was amazed when I, I saw people taking notice and deciding that if uh, this humiliation could had been hand, uh, put upon me, and I was not the first uh, uh, woman who was uh, arrested on the bus even that year. I had worked with a number of cases. The, the one that was stands out in my mind most was a young girl, 15 years old, who was arrested on the bus. And even in the time of her arrest, she was not as near the front of the bus as I was because uh, she was almost to the rear. And when she refused to stand up on the office of the driver, he had called a policeman on, and when she r refused to leave for one policeman, two others came and placed her in handcuffs and took her to jail, removed her bodily from the bus, and she was, of course, charged with assault and battery, uh, resisting arrest, and disorderly conduct. Other than the obvious, how would you say that the entire bus boycott changed your life? Well, it affected, affected it a great deal. I had been working with uh, any freedom movement over a period of years, but I had uh, not been exposed to media because my, well, even though there were times when we would want to get the notice of uh, the press such as we had, the newspapers and mm -hmm. so on, we were ignored and, and that write little articles about our hopes and aspirations for a free society, a free uh, community, and they were either ridiculed or ignored. However, after my arrest and so many other people came into the city of Montgomery and wanted to hear me talk. And I never thought of myself as a speaker, as a, only on just rare occasions. I did most of the behind the scenes work. I worked as a secretary, a counselor for the youth and the secretary of the senior branch. And, Almost every organization that I was a part of, I 
we just took notes and recorded them and wrote the articles about them. And during my husband's lifetime, of, of course, when he was quite young, he wanted to be active in helping people to become registered. That was back in the early 30s and late 20s. And I wanted to work with him, but he always thought it was very dangerous and that he would want to expose me to the, some of the things that he had to face. And I felt a bit frustrated about that. And in 1940, early 1940, during World War II, I started very seriously to uh, work with the NAACP and we had been trying to get registered to vote without uh, success. I tried at least three times before I was finally registered because it had this long number of questions and it was just one of those things that every way we turned hoping to be citizens and first class citizens and not just uh, being always uh, crushed down and, and uh, humiliated and put in an inferior position in our community. You probably met Martin Luther King Jr. before most of us throughout the nation did. What were your first impressions? I met him in August of 1955 when he had just come into Montgomery to be the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And I heard him speak at that time, but that was my f before my arrest. And I understand that he was very busy with his uh, church members getting social action committees and so on put up, uh, uh, established for working in the community. And that he was very much concerned with the conditions of our people and that he was on his way to trying to make some changes for the better in the community. However, even, I don't think he was completely prepared for what was put upon him, but he carried it well, and I always appreciate the fact that he was there with us at that time. Coming up, two Pittsburghers, famous Pittsburghers, Billy Eckstein and August Wilson. 